Kajala Medical presents COVID-19 The Answers, the show that delivers the scientific evidence-based knowledge that can safely return us all to our pre-COVID lives. My name is Dr. Fumi Okanola and I'll be hosting the show. Every week you can listen to me interview a highly respected professional about the science that can reduce your risk of becoming infected with this coronavirus. Hello and welcome to COVID-19 The Answers and our episode SARS-CoV-2 is Airborne Part 2, How Can We Combat It? I'd like to welcome back Professor Jose Jimenez. Professor Jimenez is a distinguished professor and institute fellow for the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences at the University of Colorado at Boulder in the USA. With over, with over 20 years of research experience in aerosols, he is in the top 10 most knowledgeable environmental scientists in the world on this subject matter, which has led him to research the transmission of disease during this pandemic. Jose, welcome back. Thank you for having me. So, um, all research papers or articles referred to will have links provided in the show notes. Last week, we discussed why SARS-CoV-2 is airborne. This episode is about the preventative measures needed to combat airborne viral transmission. The first half of this episode will describe each of these in turn, and in the second half, we will hear from Ms. Shannon Horn and Mr. Jason Schlosser of how they implemented ventilation and air filtration throughout the University of Colorado at Boulder's campus. Jose, together with your colleagues, you have identified four risk reduction methods for airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2. They are masking, ventilation, air filtration, and germicidal UV irradiation. Let's now drill down on each of these methods and explain them to our audience. If we start with masks. Masks have become such a major aspect of this pandemic and have impacted everyone. Placing a mask on our face in daily life is a massive societal shift. There has been real confusion about what type of mask provides adequate protection against SARS-CoV-2. With reference to a commentary published by SIDARAP, the Centre of Infectious Disease Research and Policy in Minnesota, entitled What Can Masks Do? Part 1, which stated that the most important features of anything worn on the face to prevent the emission of respiratory particles or protect the wearer from in inhaling infectious particles are filter efficiency, breathing resistance and fit in that order. Bearing that in mind, let's review each type of mask in relative context to efficacy, breathing resistance and fit. We will start with the least protective and work our way up to the most protection. If we start with cloth masks or face coverings, people love to wear cloth masks and in some cases they make them to match their clothes. Aesthetics aside, can we please look at the evidence-based facts about wearing cloth masks and the protection or not they provide against aerosol transmission? Any mask is going to be better than no mask. So wearing a cloth mask is better than, than going unmasked. Now, the problem with cloth masks, to discuss them in, in the terms that you just mentioned, is that they are very variable, right? You can buy different cloth masks and some of them are a single layer and they have nice designs and others are two layers. Some fit well or have a, a piece of metal here to fit to your nose. Some, some are larger, some are smaller. So in general, I would assume that they are not very good at any of the, of the three things, you know, unless you have a higher quality one. They can be made of higher quality, but it's hard to tell. You know, and, and uh, um, so they and, and they vary a lot. Some of our colleagues have tested the filtration of them, and, and they vary from some of them that are almost as good as an N95 to other ones that barely do anything. You know, and anything in, in between. Um, now, people love to wear them, as you said, but sometimes I, I've tested some cloth masks, and they oppose a lot more resistance to breathing. And I think. Some people who, who are tired of wearing masks, who don't want to wear masks, they have only worn masks that actually make breathing hard. And if they had tried some of the N95s that actually make breathing easier, they may have a different opinion. And the fit to the face, the, so the third thing is, is something anyone can assess by looking at, you know, do I have gaps or something? But, but many, for many masks, I would say, certainly for most of the ones I see on the street or when I go, 
to a supermarket here is poor. All right, thank you. So moving on to surgical masks, since the worldwide spread of Omicron, the, pub the public has been aware that this variant is much more contagious. And observationally, I personally have seen a shift towards the wider use of surgical masks in my area of Canada. Once again, let's discuss the evidence-based information about surgical masks, Jose. Okay, so the, the idea with surgical masks is that they are designed for someone in a hospital that may have a patient coughing on their face and it will stop those projectiles or they may be participating in surgery and there may be a splash with blood or something like that. And again, it will, it will intercept that. They are not designed to filter, right? To be a good filter that fits well to the face and fulfill the criteria that you mentioned earlier, right? And so that said, they tend to be better and more consistently manufactured than cloth masks. So, so it's an intermediate type of mask. It's important to know, like for the regulations in the US require them to be good filters, while the regulations in China and in Europe do not. There is, is basically used to protect you against the splash. Now, which ones are we getting? You know, if we get them in the US and Canada, are they following the US regulations? It's a mess because there is a lot of um, importation of, of Chinese products that are made to Chinese standards, like, like K95 masks or something like that. So, so I don't think we can assume that they are a good filter either, you know? So, I mean, I think it's, it's better than a cloth mask, but why stop there when actually we have better masks? Mm, indeed. And one of the things I've noticed about the surgical masks is they have these big gaps at the side very often. Yeah, because they are not designed not to have them, right? I mean, they are designed to, to protect you from a splash. A splash is not gonna turn the corner and come that way, right? Mm. However, the air, is going to go the way you're going to go through the nose and whatever and, and not be filtered. So that's, that's one of the big problems with them. Okay. And uh, now N95 and KN95s, um, the most protect, the most effective mask protection is provided by N95s and KN95 masks. Could you please explain the difference between a KN95 mask and an N95 filtration device? Why are these masks the best form of protection worn on the face against a coronavirus infection? Yes, yeah, so, so these masks that you mentioned, and which sometimes we call them respirators, not to be confused with, with ventilators, which is only very different. Um, these are designed to do the three things you mentioned at the beginning, to be good filters, so the material is a good filter, um, to be very breathable, so not to pose a lot of resistance to your breathing and to fit well to the face. The difference is the, the N95s are better designed. They follow a, a US standard and then and they have the straps that go through the back of your, of your neck and that tends to fit better to the face, right? So, so the N95s are the best and there are many designs out there. I mean, for example, there are some from 3M, the Aura or the B-Flex are some that people like and, and they're very comfortable, uh, but there are many, many types. KN95 is a Chinese standard, which is trying to do the same thing, but where they have favored um, it being very cheap because the, the KN95s can be folded flat so you can ship them more easily and things like that. Now they have two problems compared to the real N95s. The first one is that they don't seal as well. Anything that has the straps through the ears Seal less, seals less well on the test compared to the real N95s with the straps through the back of the head. So, and that's because of the way they sit on your face and when you talk and whatever. So they are gonna have more leaks. The second thing, which maybe is the more serious is that about half of the KN95s that are sold are fake. There has been a huge amount of production of fake KN95s in China. And for example, the ones you buy on Amazon, maybe half of them are fake. So you have to be really careful if, if that's what you want to wear. Um, you know, for people who really, they, they don't, they can't tolerate the ones with the strap behind the back and they want to wear something through the ears. Instead of the KN95s, we recommend the KF94s. So F instead of N and 94 instead of 95. Those are from a Korean standard, South Korea instead of China. And they are well designed, I think a little better than the KN95. And also there are no fakes or there are very few fakes, right? So you buy a K KF94, 
you know you're getting a real mask that's a good filter and all that you know oh that's um very informative you've enlightened me there thank you um so there have been countless pieces of um, research to show the community benefits of masking to reduce the spread of SARS-CoV-2, thus saving lives. Why do you think masking has become such a divisive issue in society? Why is there such resistance to wearing masks by a large proportion of people? I mean, I think there are, well, and that is partially a question of a sociology, but I, which is not my specialty, but I'll give my my impressions. I mean, I think culturally, you know, in, in, in East Asia, you know, they had the scares with the SARS or um, the, the flu pandemic in 2009. And, you know, they, they were more used and also for pollution in China, they're more used to wearing masks and it's something that has been normalized. Here in, in the West, you know, it's something very foreign, you know, it's, like, it's not something we have done before since maybe the flu pandemic of, of 1918 that is lost in, in memory, right? So it was something unusual. And, and I think something that didn't help is that at the beginning of the pandemic, we were told that this was transmitted through surfaces. Mm. So we wash our hands, didn't touch our face, and through these large droplets that fall to the ground. So we kept our distance. Why do we need masks? And we were told, you know, by prominent people like Dr. Fauci in the US and, and others that we don't need masks. You know, they only need masks in hospitals. So I think. At the beginning of the pandemic is when we were all very scared and paying a lot of attention and we were told that. And then later on, it started to be recognized that the virus was actually airborne. Mm. So then we started to be told that we did need to wear masks, but it was not explained why, you know? Mm. So the logic, the description of, of the transmission stayed at the surfaces and the droplets that went to the ground. But now we need a mask for that. But they didn't explain, you know, that is because we were breathing the virus in. So it was very confusing. If you don't explain to people why you are doing something, that creates a lot of resistance because, you know, they, you know. So I think that that's one reason. Then I mean, I think there are other reasons. I think in, in the U.S. and I think this had a worldwide impact. Is uh, Pre President Trump at the time really? came out strongly against against masks and then it, he turned it into a political issue. And I think that became right-wing parties everywhere kind of pick up that flag and and, and made it, a, you know, a mask is an affront to freedom and when it's really a public health measure. But, you know, and, and once it has become hardened in, in that way as a, as a political issue, it becomes very hard to undo that, you know, that's, that was a very unfortunate fact. That's an excellent and really plausible answer. Um, the evidence is clearly and plainly available in abundance, validating the effectiveness of KN95, KN95 um, N95 masks, or, or the Korean ones you mentioned, to protect against what is clearly shown to be an aerosol virus transmitted, not through touch, but through our breath and, and the air. Why do you think bodies such as Public Health and the World Health Organization have not publicized the widespread use of KN95s and N95 safeguards when they clearly provide the best protection against short range transmission? Um, that's unfortunate indeed. I mean, and it's not too clear why. I mean, I think in the case of, of the World Health Organization, um, when we talk to them, they're always worried about low income countries and, you know, what can they do in Zambia and in Namibia and in, um, you know, um, Myanmar and whatever. And, and, and they don't want to say that something is needed that is just not available everywhere. So, so from the point of view, they, 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 they are more conservative, I think, for that reason. They have finally said that they do recommend N95 masks in clinical settings. But, uh, but they recommend them. They don't say they are essential or something like that. Um, in the US, it's, it's more confusing because, you know, they, the N95 masks are, are, are available and, and there are American manufacturers have millions of them. And yet the government has also been shy. They have said they are the best, but they seem to think that they are uncomfortable or something and in ways that, that don't make any sense to me. And, I mean, I think partially the, the people in charge are the people who all their careers had, uh, had been raised in thinking that, that this was a droplet, you know, that, that droplet diseases, respiratory diseases were transmitted through these droplets. Of and they haven't yet understood just how big of a change this 
disease that no, no, we're breathing this virus in this one and all the respiratory diseases. And so they don't, I think they don't quite grasp just how important the N95s are. And, and then there's also kind of political reasons maybe that they think is, um, you know, I mean, I think for example, in the CDC that I know about that is like both with the previous president and with the current one, is, is driven more by the White House and the political needs of the next election, I kind of think than by science, you know, or, or as much. So, and I, and I think they they feel, so they have distributed free N95s and things like that, but they don't want to mandate them or something like that because they think maybe there'll be a political backslash. That's, that's my guess. I mean, and it's very unfortunate because, because if we had um, distributed them and required them and insisted and explained over and over about the fit to the face, that really will have made a huge dent on transmission, you know, and we will have saved many deaths, many cases of long COVID, but we are where we are. Yes, indeed. Right, so moving on. Jose, you were signatory to an opinion letter published in the British Medical Journal in January 2022 entitled COVID-19, an urgent call for global vaccines plus action, which is similar to the 360 degree solution I have put forward for us for getting us out of this pandemic. You and I both agree that vaccination alone will not get us out of this. Can you please explain to the audience the summarized contents of this opinion letter and why its release is so important? Yes, so the, the um, many governments, I mean, again, the US and, and many others have, you know, once they, when, when there is a bad wave, then they may endorse masks or something like that. But then like now, like the Omicron wave is going down or, or when previous waves were going down, then they resort to a vaccines only strategy, mm. meaning people should get vaccinated and then we're not gonna do anything else. You know, and the problem is the vaccines that we have right now don't stop transmission. And there is people who cannot be vaccinated because they are immunosuppressed or different reasons or they're still at high risk. And there is people who won't vaccinate for whatever political or, or other beliefs political reasons or, or, or other beliefs. So then um, it becomes, you know, if you try to rely only on vaccines and you don't have enough people vaccinated and still the vaccines are not efficient enough, you end up having a continuous level of disease that keeps causing societal disruption, death, disease, long COVID. And, um, you know, so that that is a problem. And so what, what that, strategy said is that we should keep doing more things, you know, not just the vaccines, but also some of what's called the non-pharmaceutical interventions, which is not, not necessarily drugs or vaccines, but things like ventilation, filtration, using masks for certain people or, or at certain times when the cases go high. And also, of course, some of the things like, like some of the antiviral treatments and things like that. And, and really, we need to continue to invest, you know, funding and, and, and attention and in, in, in a more complete package because that's how we can uh, really lower that, that level of disease that otherwise we're stuck living with. Thank you. In your paper, Practical Indications for Risk of Airborne Transmission in Shared Indoor Environments and their Application to COVID-19 Outbreaks, January 2022, which was an excellent paper, by the way, you talk about the need to manage the pandemic by assessing the risk of infection in a wide variety of indoor environments. We're often given vague instruction by authorities to reduce the number of people in say an indoor stadium by 50% or to increase ventilation in a given indoor space. Obviously less people in a room reduces risk but with the variety of scenarios that present themselves, such as an indoor sporting event, a subway, an office building, elevators, etc., there will be different requirements for air filtration and ventilation. While public health guidelines are vague and seem to have no logic behind them, you and your team have established a set of criteria and a formula for calculating and measuring risk that considers the different variables each scenario presents. Can you explain how you quantify risk in these variable situations and practically speaking, how implementation would be applied? Yes, so th and this is something that we've, we've been working scientifically during a lot of the pandemic. So the, 
it was realized very early on that this was an indoor pandemic. You know, we had super spreading indoors and, you know, and, and the Japanese gave us the free seas, you know, avoid crowded spaces and um, that are basically full ventilated. I forget what, what the initials are, but, but basically um, certain types of spaces, but they were described qualitatively. And what's crowded? Is, is my Christmas dinner crowded? Or, you know, is that the space low ventilated or poorly ventilated? Indeed, if you don't have quantification, then, then, you know, at the end you leave it up to interpretation and a lot of people, you know, either they don't know, you know, so they think maybe situations are safe that really are not, right? So then, so we pursued a couple of ways and one way is on the, on the paper you mentioned. So we were thinking, how can we do this more quantitatively? And one way you can, is by looking at the outbreaks that have already happened. You know, so we have the cases like the choir that we investigated in the US and the famous restaurant in China and those buses in China and the airplane that arrived in Vietnam and the call center in Korea and the school in Israel and the meat packing plant in Germany. And we have enough data from all of these, you know, to, to know what was being done and what happened. So then what we try to say is like, can we explain this with airborne transmission? And indeed we can, they, we can explain them all at the same time with urban transmission. And in doing so, we know, we can tell, you know, okay, how risky was one with respect to the other and how risky are situations in which a downbreak hasn't happened yet, right? So you can do a, a calculation that's relatively simple that has to do with, basically, I mean, if, if we remember, how are we getting infected? Some infected person is exhaling this invisible smoke, the room is trapping it because there is low ventilation, and other people are breathing it, you know? And the more that happens, the more we may have super spreading. What's gonna increase the chance of this happening? If we spend more time, if we have more people, if the ventilation is lower, if the volume is lower, right? If you're in a very big room, there's gonna be a lot of dilution because of the volume. And also if we have vocalization, if we, if we are yelling or we are exercising, you know, we're gonna be breathing more air and we're gonna be exhaling many more viruses and whether we're wearing masks or not, you know. So you put all these numbers, you squish them into a single number and it turns out that that allows you to predict the risk of different events. And this is something that we could do everywhere. You know, in fact, we, we, that's what we are proposing in that paper and some follow-up work that public health could calculate that everywhere. And, and I mean, the results wouldn't be too surprising, you know, gyms and restaurants and bars would be the riskier ones, libraries and movie theaters would be less risky, but we would know even, you know, there's, there's restaurants or supermarkets or whatever that are very different from each other. You know? So that's um, that's what, what we propose and it can be done and it would explain the outbreaks. And um, the problem is so far, th this is very foreign to public health authorities, you know, just like the whole airborne transmission paradigm. So, you know, so we, we I think we, we're gonna need to keep you know, explaining it and trying to to get through, but it, but it's something that that works very well. That's ingenious. Um, you know, um, thank you for your work on that. That's just phenomenal. You have clearly established SARS-CoV-2 as an airborne virus. It stands to reason that we need clean, safe air to breathe. There are a number of different factors to consider with air filtration and ventilation that we will be discussing throughout this podcast. On our previous podcast, you discussed the climate or external environment, i.e. hot, humid or cold environments, effect on selecting the appropriate air filtration or ventilation systems. In the same paper, you have established the brilliant formula that you mentioned that factors in these variables and can be applied in various socioeconomic and environmental conditions. In order for the audience to understand the relative context of the question, let's use two extreme examples. One, an ice hockey arena with 16,000 fans and a wealthy ownership group versus two, a kindergarten school in a poor area where kids can't be vaccinated because they are under five years old. Please explain how the formula works in these two contrasting scenarios. Well, if you think of a, of a large arena, and this is an indoor arena or an outdoor yeah, open indoor, indoor arena. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so if it's a modern arena, they tend to have uh, quite good ventilation because you know you may have people there for several hours and, and you don't want it to smell bad or to accumulate too much exhaled air. So they tend to have 
Um, and also if you have players that are, you know, you want to supply them with, with, uh, with air to breathe. So they tend to have good ventilation. Now, the, the, um, in a situation like that, um, the main risk will also be from the people right next to you, you know, because if there is someone, you know, you have 16,000 people, someone is infected, you know, 30 meters or 100 meters away, that's, that's not going to be very likely that that gets to you. But if, if you have people that are yelling, you know, someone scores and you're like, yeah, that, or the person behind you or something, that may produce a lot of virus. And if you are right there and before the ventilation system has a chance to take that virus away, that's how you could get infected. But otherwise, it's, it's a relatively safer situation. It also depends, you know, again, the vocalization is very important. If people are, I don't know, listening to classical music and, and uh, quiet is different than a very raucous uh, sports game where people are continuously yelling at the referee or whatever. Um, now, uh, for a school, um, schools vary a lot, but many of the schools, especially in, in low income areas, you know, they tend to be old buildings that are relatively small and often poorly ventilated, you know. You try to seal them to conserve the, the heat in winter or the cold in, in the summer, and then the air is kind of trapped. So that that would be a riskier situation, especially the more the more talking um, that happens, right? If you have, uh, you know, for example, there was a case in California where the teacher was infected, and then she was reading to the to the students, and and to read, she took the mask off precisely when she was producing the more virus, and then a lot of the students got infected, right? So that can happen. If a student is infected and the students are more, you know, more passive and they are not talking, then that's, um, that is less dangerous because they, they are gonna be putting less virus in the air. But, but if they are doing some projects or they're talking or something like that, then that again, increases the risk. So how, I mean, with the ice hockey arena, which is indoors, you, with the ice being there and it being cooler, does the humidity make a difference? And how would you apply your formula in that instance? Oh, yeah, yeah. So sorry, maybe, maybe I, I heard the arena, but not ice hockey. If they're actually playing ice hockey, um, then what, what happens is that uh, the ice is very cold and then the ice co cools the air that's right on top of it. And we get something that's called stratification. That air doesn't mix with the air that's above, that's warmer, right? And and people have tested this with some of these smoke making machines. And see, if you put the smoke in the lower layer, it kind of stays trapped there. So as the athletes are exercising, um, the virus may get trapped in this layer. And there have been right. outbreaks in in um, hockey arenas, quite a few, that we think are at least partially explained for this reason. So you know. So in that case, like, like the Canadian uh, women in the Olympics, you want to play with a good N95 mask, or maybe you want to see if you can put some fans, uh, some large fans in the corners that take that air and mix it up upwards or things like that. Right, I see. Moving to the second risk reduction method, ventilation. The conventional definition of ventilation is the process of providing outside or external clean air into an indoor space by natural or mechanical means. For most of us, our understanding of ventilation in a closed room involves opening a window. Could you please explain the principle of ventilation in the context of removing virus from contaminated air as it relates to a typical heating, ventilation, air conditioning system or HVAC? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as, as you said, you explained it clearly. The, the idea is that you have indoor air that has the virus or some other contaminant and you take that air that has the floating virus and you put it outside in some way and then you get air from outside that doesn't have that contaminant, right? So that's ventilation. And you open the windows, then that, that's easy to understand. Um, for a heating and ventilation air conditioning system, it's, it's one of these systems that has tubes. And basically you have a tube that's bringing air often in the ceiling, sometimes on the side, on the wall. And it's, you know, you put your hand there and you feel that there is air coming into the room and that's the air that's coming from the ventilation system. And normally you have another tube and then the air is being sucked into that one. So one is called the supply, the other is called the return. And then the air is, is, is being taken away, right? Um, that happens, you know, in most, uh, <coughs> sorry, many government buildings, commercial buildings, things like that. Now, um, 
often to save energy, that system is in a closed loop, meaning you are taking the air that maybe has the virus and then you're cooling it or heating it or whatever, and you're bringing it back into the room after going through some kind of filter. Um, what happens, I mean, and you do that to save energy, right? If you're in, in Canada in the winter and it's very cold, you don't want to dump the warm air that you have indoors outdoors and then take air that's very cold and warm it up because you increase your energy use a lot, right? Or you think in Vegas in the summer will be the other way, you know, you have to cool all this air and that costs you a lot of energy. Now, during the pandemic, we want to do two modifications to improve that. We want to take as much outside there as possible. You know, it is going to cost us more energy, but, you know, right now it's like saving transmission, you know, is more important than, than saving energy during a, a, a limited period of time. And the other one is there is always a filter in these systems, right? So even though the air may, may just come back, it always goes through a filter because there is a fan and the fan will get dirty, we get all this dust and whatever and will stop working if we didn't protect it with a filter. But that filter, you know, what type of filter is installed in these systems, the cheapest one available. You know, that's, mm. that's the way the world works. And, and those are not very good to remove the virus. So, but they can be replaced by something that maybe costs 50% more, but it's 50% of, of not a very big cost, you know, 50% of hundred dollars, so maybe it's 150, but it's not, something that's gonna break the bank. And those remove a lot more virus. So the combination of taking more air from outdoors, however much as possible, and improving the, the filters is gonna keep us better protected. Oh, excellent. So every HVAC, as, as you've described, will, will change the air in a room X times per hour, depending on its age, quality, and sophistication. The measurement of this HVAC system is called air changes per hour or ACH. The standard HVAC changes the air in a room from what I could find between naught and one times per hour or just recirculates the air. What are the air changes per hour needed to remove SARS-CoV-2 and protect us from getting infected? Mm -hmm. Okay, no, so you, you explained it well. I mean, it, it it varies this, this number of how well ventilated is a place. It varies a lot, right? Um, but typical, I mean, my house, for example, is one air change per hour or, or maybe less than that. And many schools are, you know, one or less. And, you know, so those are risky numbers. Now, there isn't a, a number that I can say, oh, if you're more than X, then you're safe, right? Is the more, the higher the number, the safer you are. There's always gonna be some residual risk indoors, right? For example, WHO already in November 2020, when they started to realize this was another one virus, they recommended six air changes per hour, meaning, you know, basically every 10 minutes you are replacing the air in that place. So you can imagine someone is exhaling this invisible smoke. Imagine now there's someone smoking, but every 10 minutes you are taking that air and you're putting it outside. Um, so that's something that would make any situation a lot safer. Does that make a, a situation completely safe? Well, in a movie theater, you know, where, where the risk is inherently slow, basically, yes. In, you know, in the COVID world of the hospital or in a, in a loud bar or, or in, you know, in a gym, that may not be enough and you may want to go higher or you may want to do other things, you know. Okay, thank you. During the pandemic, you have proposed that carbon dioxide sensors be placed in every public indoor space as an indication of effective ventilation. Can you please explain to the audience how this works and why it would be effective? What would be the cost implications of this measure? Okay. Um, yeah, so as I was saying earlier, we've been looking the whole pandemic for ways of characterizing which indoor spaces are the more dangerous ones so that people can prioritize the measures and protect themselves and avoid maybe the more dangerous spaces. And uh, we tried the, the method with the, the mathematical indicator that we discussed before. And I think that works well, but that's, that's confusing for the individual person that's going to many different spaces. That's more something to do for public health to do, just like they may rate restaurants according to their cleanliness, you know, we could, we could have a sign in each inner space kind of saying what the relative risk is. Um, but the CO2 is something more direct and easier to understand. So to explain it briefly, air is made of molecules, you know, that are colliding with each other, little balls, and most of them are 
nitrogen and oxygen. So out of every million molecules outdoors, you know, the large majority are again nitrogen, oxygen, a few other things, but about 400 are carbon dioxide, CO2. And that's increasing slowly in time, you know, 420, 421, 422 every year. That's what's causing climate change. But that's very slow compared to the, the times that we care about in a pandemic, which are kind of, uh, you know, hours or whatever. Um, now, humans exhale CO2. The food that we eat, you know, we basically burn that organic material that we're eating through our metabolism, and we exhale CO2 as a waste product. And our breath has about 40,000 per million instead of 400, right? So it's 100 times more CO2 than what's in a room if there is nobody there, right? Mm. So now this allows us to see how much exhaled air is indoors, right? If, for example, if, if you measure indoors with, with one of these CO2 meters and you see that there is 400 parts per million, that means it's almost the same as outdoors. It's very well ventilated. If you see that there is 4,000, for example, that means 10% of the air there has already been exhaled by someone. You know, second hand there has been inside the lungs of someone has come out. That's a situation that's more conducive to transmission. That's, that's risky. You know, if, if we go even higher and I've seen measurements up to 7,000, that starts to be now, you're at 16% of the air has already been inside someone else's lungs. Now there are these CO2 meters. This is one example you see, you know, it's portable, small battery operator. The batteries last a couple of years and they measure how much CO2 is in the room every minute, you know? Mm. So you can have this in your pocket or you can have it in the wall in different places. And it's very easy to see if a place is well ventilated or not. This is very useful because for example, we go into many buildings doing research and they say, oh, we have this great ventilation system. And you start measuring CO2 and you see that, that they don't, you know, it's, it's, it's very poorly ventilated and they are very surprised. And then what you realize is that the system is off or something has broken and nobody has noticed for three years, you know, wow. or things like that. So, and, and then some systems have, may have, a insu, you know, insufficient ventilation for other reasons. So what we've been proposing is that every public space where we share the air, we have one of these meters in the wall. And then, so you go into a supermarket, into a bar, into a, um, a government building, and you see how high the CO2 is. Just like often you see temperature and humidity, you should also have uh, CO2. This was already a law before the pandemic in places like Taiwan or South Korea that have done better than us in the pandemic. And it has become a law during the pandemic in places like Belgium for certain for restaurants and bars and gyms and in certain parts of Argentina or Spain. And we actually have a map with all the places that have implemented this measure. And this is very effective to, to reduce transmission. The cost is not very high. You know, one of these meters if you did this massively, you know, Canada or the US said, or, or a certain state or city, we have to have this everywhere. You know, the cost of installing it is about a hundred dollars for every indoor space compared to the, you know, the losses of not being able to open your restaurant or whatever, that does nothing, you know, or in, or in a gym or in a school or whatever. And, you know, so the cost is, is, is low. So, so we think we, we need to go there in the medium term. And, and as I said, some places are doing it. What we find is uh, a lot of resistance from the people who operate the buildings because they realize that if this is displayed, it's gonna be obvious to everyone that the ventilation is poor. You know, so, so I say, oh, no, no, we, we don't need them. We don't need them. But, but we, we think precisely that that's how you motivate change, you know. That's an ingenious, simple method. Um, and, you know, with this program, we're, we're just going to make people aware of it. That's the whole point. And, and I think that's what I want. If I want to go into the gym or a restaurant, I want to see one of those on the wall or maybe even carry my own. So I think, you know, once people are aware that that is such an ingenious, simple way of seeing whether the air is, is, is being ventilated or filtered, um, then they'll demand it and then, and then we'll, 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 we'll get that. So, no, that's great. So my other question is, um, so if the, what, what is the range that it should be? Is You mentioned 400, so should it be 400 or below is it to, to indicate that you have good ventilation? I mean, that, that would be great. I mean, but, but um, in practice it's something like the distance, right? What distance do you wanna keep from other people to reduce transmission? You know, WHO says one meter, here they say six feet in the UK, say a meter and a half, you know, is one better than the other, you know, and, and what you see is that the more distance, the better, but what is feasible? WHO will tell us that 
you know, if we say two meters, then in India, they cannot keep two meters. There's too many people in many places. Therefore, they are gonna ignore distance when actually keeping one meter, which is more feasible, has a big benefit, right? So with the CO2, it's the same thing, you know, it's like, is, is a thousand low enough or is 700 or 500, you know, the lower the better, but also we, you have to take into account what's feasible. So, so in our group of scientists, we have been saying, keep it at 700 or below, right? Why? The risk is not zero, but the idea is that you, you identify those places that are very common where you are at two, three, four, five thousand, mm -hmm. and you bring those to 700 or below. Lower if you can, but otherwise 700. And you have done a lot of, of the protection that you can do through ventilation. Then you are going to need other layers. You are still going to need masks, or filtration, or other things. But, but at least this gives you a good target. The, the CDC here in the US has been saying 800. You know, in some places they say maybe a thousand. It's like, well, I mean, a thousand is a lot better than three thousand. You know, so mm. so you have to see what's what's feasible. And you know, the, the one thing I didn't mention earlier, but the one limitation of CO two is CO two takes into account ventilation, but not filtration, because the filters will remove the aerosols and the virus, but not the CO two. So if you have a lot of filtration, then you can tolerate a little higher CO two. We've been saying, you know, if you don't have filtration maybe keep it below 700. If you have a lot of filtration, then keep it below 1,000. Mm, thank you. Well, from the words of the expert. The third method of risk reduction for airborne transmission is air filtration. It's not always possible to ventilate a room such as an interior office space or a subway train, as you've already mentioned. Therefore, air filtration becomes an important solution. Air filtration is the means of cleaning the air in a room with a filter, making dirty, contaminated air clean. Filtering the air is a very important aspect of making a room safe from the virus, as you've mentioned. As a typical filter on a HVAC system is not sufficient protection, additional specialised filters are required. Please explain what a MERV filter is and how it can be fitted to an existing HVAC system. Can you also discuss standalone portable air filtration systems? How do these two systems work in a room to filter SARS-CoV-2? Okay. So yeah, uh, filtration is a, is a very old technology that works very well and is not very costly, you know? So, and it, it works by basically a filter, a mask is a filter that we wear, and, uh, but it doesn't, we don't need to wear it. It can also be, you know, propelled with a, with a fan. The air goes through this big mask, basically, which is with the filter. And then the virus gets trapped there. Basically the filter is a bunch of fibers, has some holes. So the idea is that it lets the air through, but then the aerosol is not like it gets stuck, like if it was a colon there, but due to microscopic physics, it's gonna stick to those fibers. Yeah. Now, uh, as you said, they, it can be done in two ways. One is through the HVAC system, either on the furnace on your house, if you have a forced air system, or in a building, uh, which has the system of tubes that we discussed earlier. In that case, there's always going to be a filter ahead of the fan and the, the heating and cooling equipment to protect it from getting it dirty, right? And the MERF, which is, I think, is minimum efficiency reporting value or something like that, it's an acronym. And that just means how good the filter is, right? You can imagine some filters that are more transparent, that they, they let more air through, but also trap less of these aerosols, right? And others that are start to look more like an N95 mask, you don't see through, and they are gonna trap more, more, more aerosol, but they are also gonna impede the airflow a little more, right? So then I think the lowest grade may be MERV 6 or 7, and they go all the way to MERV 16, right? And the higher the number, the better the filter is, right? Mm. So what, what typically in most places you will see is a MERV 7 or 8 because it's the cheapest and it's good enough to protect the equipment. You just need to protect the equipment from, you know, dust and hair and stuff like that. But it's not very good to filter the virus or the aerosols that contain the virus. So um, now, ideally you would say, well, I would put a MERV 16, I would put the best filter. Or even beyond the MERV system, there is something called HEPA filters that are much more efficient than any of the MERV filters. We say, why don't we put a HEPA filter in, in my furnace? The problem is that, as I said, as, as you put a, a better and better filter, it restricts the flow of air more. And at some point the fan just can't move enough air through the filter, right? 
So you say, I have a great filter, but very little air is going through. And then you are hot or cold because the, you, are, you, are, you are throttling basically the, the HVAC system. So in most places, you can still go to a MERV 13. In some places they say, well, 13 doesn't work, but we go to 11. And that's a compromise. It's the best filter you can put in there, but with the system still working. Okay. And that, that helps a lot for the aerosols that we think have the virus, it may go from removing 20 or 30% to removing 80%, right? It's not 100%, but it's a lot better than 20 or 30%, and you still have the system working, right? Now, in some places, you know, you don't have a system with tubes, or maybe um, you have a lot of people, it's a risky situation, or, you know, for whatever other combination of reasons, you can also have these basically standalone filters in the room. And there are two types. Uh, one is what we call the portable HEPA filters, the commercial HEPA filters. So you look into Amazon or go to a store, you you will find these filters. And those have a, it's a box that you plug in the wall, has a fan, and one of these HEPA filters that nothing escapes, basically. Any, any aerosol that comes there of any size is going to be trapped by that filter. So that's great. The problem is that they are expensive, that, you know, for, for a classroom, like the classroom where my son is, you know, I... I donated some HEPA filters, but they cost me $500 per classroom, you know? So that's, you know, for many schools, you're still going to talk about tens of thousands of dollars and that's, it is not affordable in many places. So something else that, that uh, we've been working uh, during the pandemic is you don't actually need to use these expensive HEPA filters. You can build with, with these MERV filters that we use in, in, um, in houses and a box fan, you know, a typical fan that you use in the summer, you can basically duct tape them together and make one of these Corsi Rosenthal boxes that work really well. And they cost one eighth of a commercial HEPA filter for the same amount of cleaner, you know? Oh. So that's something that now you suddenly you have something that instead of costing $500, it costs $75 per classroom. And now, is, you know, even if you have 30 classrooms or whatever, okay, you're talking about $1,500, not about, you know, um, $15,000, you know, something like that. So, so it's, it's much more feasible. So, so that this is something that as long as, you know, we continue to have the virus, we think it should be done, you know, in all classrooms, in all um, situations that don't already have excellent ventilation. And especially it helps, you know, people don't want to wear masks. So this is something that helps protect people you know, even as the mask mandates uh, are removed and that kind of thing. So where can people learn how to make these box filters? Is there a website or something? There, there are many websites. I mean, there is, there is one that's called cleanaircrew.org. That's, that's one that, that has very good explanations. And then once you see there how to spell Corsi Rosenthal, you can then Google it. And there is many resources, videos. I mean, there is, if, I mean, it has become a phenomenon. There is many articles and, and that explain and, and people make them in, the, in different ways, but, but basically it's, it's not that complicated. I mean, many people are making it, they have fourth grade students making them as a class project. You know, you don't need to be a, a rocket scientist to make these. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And that will obviously be in the show notes. Um, so um, now let's turn to attention to the fourth re risk reduction method, germicidal UV radiation. I recently read an article posted on Twitter by your colleague, Professor Shelley Miller, entitled, Here's How to Clean Our Indoor Air Properly Against COVID-19 by a Professor Edward Nardell, published in Time magazine on the 1st of February, 2022. He described upper room germicidal UV radiation fixtures as a quote, a more than 80 year old technology, well proven, safe and underused for airborne infection control. He stated that all known pathogenic microbes contain either DNA or RNA and are susceptible to germicidal UV. Translated this into terms people can understand, SARS-CoV-2 and a whole range of infectious germs, such as bacteria, other viruses, and possibly fungi, could be killed by this technology, known as germicide or UV radiation. Once again, in layman terms, could you please explain how germicide or UV radiation works, and in what circumstances would it be beneficial? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, this is correct, and, and indeed, Arnaldo is, is basically the, the world leader in this technology. So the idea is that 
Um, it's different than ventilation and filtration. In ventilation, basically, you are taking the air with the floating virus and putting it outside. In filtration, you are taking the air with the floating virus. You are going through a filter so that the air comes out, but the virus is trapped. So you are keeping the air, but you are removing the virus. In disinfection, of which germicidal UV is, is the one technique that, that, um, that is, is valuable, you are actually keeping the air and keeping the virus floating in the air and you are gonna breathe in that virus still, but you are hoping to kill it, to de deactivate it before you breathe it in. So even you are breathing it in, that virus is not gonna infect you, right? That's disinfection of the air. Now, um, immediately from that description, you see actually it has some disadvantages compared to filtration or ventilation. For example, filtration is also gonna remove allergens and other contaminants. If you have a forest fire, and, or you have you know, just indoor pollution from cooking or from other reasons, the filter is gonna remove a lot of it. Um, the UV radiation actually is not, and it may actually do some chemistry. But, but you know, if you are mostly concerned about disinfecting the air about the virus and not getting infected, then it can be valuable. And really what's going on is the virus you know, is floating in the air and you're gonna shine this hard UV light. And the virus, you know, we call it, it's an RNA virus. Um, and, and the RNA is, is a nucleic acid, and this UV light is gonna damage some of the molecules in there. And it's gonna change their shape and it's gonna make some, some new chemical bonds so that the virus, even if, if it finds a cell, is no longer able to make a copy of itself, basically. Right. So that's, that's how the disinfection works. And from my understanding, they have these big, fans which they put on the ceiling because the uv light is quite dangerous isn't it it can it can cause cancers and cataracts so they suck the air up and and, and into a special container um that prevents the uv light from escaping and the air passes through that container and out again disinfected is that correct that's one way that there are there are different ways actually the um... Often there's a couple of ways that tend to be more effective. One is you can have one of these ceiling fans that moves a lot of air, you know, for regular cooling or whatever. And you can have the lights there, but pointing up, you know, so then they are not gonna shine on anyone's skin or, um, or eyes, but because the fan is moving a lot of air, the air in the room is going to very frequently encounter that disinfection. So that works very well and it's pretty cheap. Then there are the systems that you mentioned that you do the same, but you do it with a box. Sometimes they have a fan, sometimes they don't, and they just rely on the air naturally moving in the room. Other times, if you have a tall room, you can shine the air on the high part of the room and again, uh, disinfect a lot of air. And since the air is naturally coming up and down, that's also gonna give you a benefit. Other times, uh, if we have one of these systems with tubes where we can have the filters, um, we can put the lights in there. And then as the air is going, in and out is gonna go through those fluorescent tubes and it's gonna be disinfected that way. So there are different ways. And finally, I mean, all of the techniques I mentioned, they are the ones that are normally used with what's called 254 nanometers. That's the wavelength of the radiation that comes from these fluorescent tubes. But there's a new type, uh, which is called the 222 nanometers that comes from these LEDs. And that's actually, apparently safe that it shines on us because even though it's very harsh UV light, it's absorbed by the, our dead skin on the surface or the, the first layer of your eyes. So, so the idea is that there you can just shine it everywhere in the room and it's safe. And, you know, so that may be the future. Right now, that is very expensive, you know, so, so it's not going to be everywhere now. But maybe by the next pandemic, if, if the cost comes down, that could be a very effective solution. Yes, that's called far UVC lighting. And we've got an episode on that coming up with uh, Professor Kirk Atkinson. He's gonna tell us all about that. So, well, thank you for that explanation. So my final question is, we all want to stop having to wear masks. It's so impersonal. In your opinion, if we implemented the three risk mitigation measures discussed, ventilation, air filtration, germicidal UV radiation, could we stop having to wear masks indoors to prevent transmission and therefore infection with SARS-CoV-2, particularly the highly infectious Omicron variant? It will help a lot, you know, it, it will depend in, in the devil is on the details, right? Because it, when you say, when you implement filtration, many times I go to a medical office and they say, oh yeah, we have these HEPA filters. They have these tiny HEPA filters that look <laughs> like, like they are from a, 
that they are a toy and they are off because they make noise. So, so they have like their this talisman, but you know, now if you have serious filtration, serious ventilation, serious disinfection, that's a different thing. So I would say, you know, so probably yes, except when the cases are high, you know, if we have another wave and the cases go high, we're gonna need the masks again because probably this, this ventilation, whatever is, is very good, but it may not be enough. So you need to supplement it with a mask. The other exception is maybe for people who are at higher risk, you know, people who are under cancer treatment or after a transplant or they are immunosuppressed for other reasons. So those people probably wanna continue wearing masks just as an extra layer of protection because if they get infected, the, the consequences for them would be, would be much more serious. And of course, you know, everyone who thinks they may have a cold or a flu or whatever, and they have to go indoors no matter what, for whatever reason, they should wear a mask, you know, just, just as a courtesy and to, to protect others. But, but it would move us, you know, if we really took these non-pharmaceutical interventions and, and really made the indoor air cleaner, it would make it much safer and, and, and we, we could liberate ourselves from the masks uh, much more. And it would also remove allergens so we have a lot of less allergies, a lot less asthma, and also the problems associated with, with pollution, you know, that would also be reduced. So we will have enormous health benefits mm. um, for something that is not that costly. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. And we're going to touch on that again when Shannon and um, Jason join us. Um, thank you so much, Jose, for, you know, such an informative um, interview today. Um, one thing that sprung to mind is that, you know, there's all these, these various forms of ventilation, filtration, basically risk reduction me methods for removing the virus from the atmosphere. It sounds like there's going to need to be, you know, some focus and organization for implementation. Like you mentioned like the little box, um, a HVAC on someone's desk. I think people don't realize that there's physics, you know, the dimensions of the room um, have to be taken into consideration. So I think governments and public health are going to have to um, get together with people like yourselves and there's going to have to be approved engineering um, companies in certain provinces or, or areas that can go out and do it in the big locations and then there's going to have to be people pointed in smaller environments to maybe utilize things like your formulas um, or, or learn how to basically you know assess the dimensions of a room so that they don't they get the right filter or the right number of filters um, in, a, in a given space for them to work adequately. I completely agree, as well as using CO2 meters is a way that, you know, that is the least confusing way to, to make headway in this area. And I mean, unfortunately, the pandemic, uh, for the reasons we discussed earlier, that, that there has been this denial and this resistance for urban transmission, public health and governments have not really gotten very deep on, on, on giving an opinion about or, or guidelines about, about what to do, you know. So CDC has some of these guidelines on the webpage and they're good, they're the same things we've been saying, but almost nobody knows they are there because they haven't publicized them, they don't talk about them, you know. Mm. And, uh, and unfortunately it's been a free for all in, in the way that some companies have just made wild claims, in many cases completely false, and they have sold things like some, for example, some of these chemical disinfectants that Many of them don't work and many are actually dangerous. And yet they have been installed in thousands of schools and billions of dollars have been wasted on, on this stuff. And now we need to waste more millions of dollars removing them. You know, so this has been very unfortunate and has been a failure of, of governments in, in most places. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely in agreement. Now, today the White House, for example, here in the US has, has released um, a new, a new plan, you know, to, to implement some of these things, not, not just uh, ventilation, whatever, but also tests and many other things. But w for example, I have helped uh, write that plan and along with many other experts. And, you know, now, of course, the devil is in the details. Is that gonna be just a plan that stays on paper or is that gonna be implemented? But, you know, we need basically governments to push in this direction and to do exactly what you, what you said. I think it needs to come from the people. The people have to demand it and, and they're going to demand it by knowing about it. So we're just seeing Shannon's coming in now. So I'm just going to admit to her. Okay. Thank you so much, Jose, for such a fascinating talk. 
Jose has done an amazing job of outlining the evidence-based science supporting risk reduction for what is plainly a virus that spreads via aerosols infecting the air we breathe. Thank you so much. And, and Shannon's now join us, joined us and we're going to move over to Shannon. So thank you, Jose. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of COVID-19 The Answers. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe, rate and review and do visit our website kajalamedical.com forward slash COVID-19 The Answers. Yeah.